fantastic Friday morning, an amazing TGIF to every single one of you. Kelly Shiasone here, Landed for Success, Untold Stories. It is absolutely my pleasure to be joined by an amazing gentleman this morning, one of our co-authors, our incredible co-authors. Uh, there's a little bit of distance uh, between Mr. Elliot Hiller and myself. And uh, he sits on the other side of uh, the little pond <laughs> on, the, on the coast there. And he's tuning in from London over in the UK. And he is a coach. He is a trainer. He is an author, a composer, record producer. He loves helping people uh, through personal development. Uh, he's been serving others and lifting others up and people they know for quite some time. I'd say it's fair to say, uh, we'll, we'll, be, we'll, be, we'll be conservative here and say a couple decades. <laughs> but he's been doing it and he continues to do it. And it is really, really my entire pleasure, Elliot, um, to be wrapping up uh, this week with you. And I know how active your schedule is. So thank you very much for carving time out to hop on here and talk to all of us. And for all of you tuning in live or who are gonna catch us on the replay, you're really in for a treat uh, to get and sit and have a one-on-one -on -one and get to know who Mr. Elliot Hiller is a little bit better and look forward to reading his chapter in the first book in our Land of First Success series, Untold Stories. So, Elliot, so Kelly. nice to see you. <laughs> Kelly, it's very nice to see you. Now then, Kelly, let's start with this distance between us that you mentioned. Were you referring to a physical distance or an emotional distance between us, Kelly? I was thinking physical, because there is, there is some serious miles in between. <laughs> he's, I would love Elliot to be my neighbor, because I think you're, he's a fun guy. Elliot, you are a fun guy. Uh, and that would be really entertaining for a lot of different reasons. But no, unfortunately, physically distant, uh, we are. Uh, I'd keep you up late at night playing loud music. And in the last couple of years, it's more and more classical. And um, someone walking uh, past the um, apartment here in London uh, said uh, they're learning Beethoven's Fifth Symphony off by heart. Fantastic. So you would do the I'd, classical I'd awesome. Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. I would do the disco version. And then all of the rest <laughs> of the neighbors would be in for an entire treat. <laughs> You know, I, um, I studied in Switzerland for four years in my 20s. I studied uh, eurythmy therapy. And as part of the course, you have to like write a diploma at the end. You have to write a thesis. And I wrote mine on um, how Beethoven's symphonies were mirrored in his biography. How you could tell what was going on at what stage of his life, um, especially uh, through the third, fifth, seventh, and ninth symphonies. Yeah. What did you and, find uh, out? I found out they mirrored absolutely exactly, you know, Amazing. because the story of Beethoven is how he overcame his deafness to become uh, this great, incredible uh, composer. Yeah. Did you know he went deaf? I did know he went deaf. I don't know a lot about him. Uh, I have not studied him. He was but... actually a pianist at the beginning and uh, um, for improvising live at concerts. And um, around the turn of the century, um, uh, from the uh, 18th to the 19th century, he started to lose his hearing. And his friends noticed it when in the quiet passages where he thought he was playing pianissimo, the most quiet, he actually didn't play anything at all. He thought he was, because he couldn't hear that he wasn't playing it. He was losing his hearing for the high notes, first of all. Mm -hmm. And they thought maybe he's got rheumatism, maybe he can't do it. Next couple of years, hearing went downhill. He went to lots of doctors. He called them quacks because they gave him all kinds of terrible treatments, which only made it worse. And um, in 1803, he wrote his famous testament, his will and testament. He's thinking of committing suicide. He can't hear anymore. He's a musician. He's losing the sense which he, he needs to be able to work. But on the other hand, he will not leave this earth until he has brought forth all the 
um, works and talents that he knows he was supposed to um, deliver in this life, no matter how long he suffers. When death comes, it will be welcome, but it will not be by his own hand. Famous uh, Heiligenstadt Testament. And uh, he lived another 24 years till 1827. So he turned in with Kelly, do you see? His challenge of not being able to be a, a, a pianist anymore and performing made him go inward where he heard the music in his head, could write it down. Other people played it, had the pleasure of it, and he heard it in his head. Can you imagine? So his adversity- That's beautiful. Oh yeah, his adversity brought him to compose these wonderful works. My favorite quote from Napoleon Hill, every adversity bears within it the seed of an equal or better opportunity. It just depends what we make of it. You know, people have hardships, people have challenges. Uh, it's one of the things that our book is going to be about, isn't it? Um, how to overcome these challenges. And uh, if you see an adversity as a possibility for a better opportunity, then in the moment that you're faced with the adversity, with the challenge, you'll already be on, on the right track to make the best out of it. Because, oh, hey, hey, I've got a problem here. Good. Something good can come out of it. It all depends how I deal with it. So I told you that and you didn't even ask me a question, did you? <laughs> no, I, this is going to turn into just me talking with Mr. Elliot Hiller here. <laughs> I am. I have to ask you, okay, so how did you, where did you find your love of music? Who introduced you to your love of music that you ended up studying it? Well, Bob Dylan, radio, when I was young. Actually, yeah, Bob Dylan. And I was, I was really young when I went to his first ever concert at the Royal Albert Hall when he was still singing folk music and at that time he was like um, not so well known but well known enough that the Beatles were sitting in a box there saw them over in the distance yeah and got a guitar started to play yeah does does everyone love music but they don't develop their gifts or they don't sing how many people say I can't sing but have they ever had singing lessons or have you, you know, if you put headphones on and you get the music plugged straight into your head, don't you find that people can suddenly sing in tune? Yes. Yeah, the, I, that is a, super interesting because we had this conversation with our four kids, what was it, a couple of weeks ago. And our daughter, she sings, she has a lovely voice. And she had said, well, I don't, you know, I don't sing. And I said, well, I've heard you sing. So then at the table, we're all talking about this. Well, what makes, why, what makes you say you're not a singer? Well, I haven't taken lessons. Well, but I'm hearing you. I think we're all singers. So that was, it grew into, and they're all musicians, uh, as growing musicians. But that was an interesting conversation. And from there, we're not here to talk about that but that's where that went and how people will say well I, I can't play an instrument you can't or you don't because you haven't given yourself the opportunity yeah, because you haven't see. yet learned exactly exactly mm -hmm. so you know after music is amazing it is so so after i studied the um the therapy, the Eurythmy therapy, which is a movement therapy uh, in Switzerland for four years. I had a job offer in uh, Germany. I thought I'd only go for one or two years. I ended up living 28 years in Germany. I worked in a specialized clinic for addiction therapy. So people with all kinds of substance abuse, heroin and cocaine and, and alcohol, uh, but also gambling addicts, all kinds of addiction. And um, as part of my work, I held talks in schools for parents and, and for the elder pupils there. And my talk was called, uh, the, the stronger the child, the weaker the temptation. And the message was quite simply, how do you make your child strong? Parents, yeah, of all ages, from a young age, see whatever gifts, talents and abilities that your children have and help Thank them you. develop it, help them develop it. Because the biggest frustration in life is, 
knowing that you could be doing something else if only you had the opportunity. You might not even know what it is that you'd like to be doing or that you could be doing, but if you haven't been able to develop your gifts, talents and abilities, the reason why you were born on earth, your intention of why you incarnated on earth in this life to work on this and this and this and this and that, and you're not able to do it, huge frustration. And that's where addiction stifling. Sets, that's where depressions yeah. set in. That's where uh, anger and violence set in because the frustration people are about to break out of this straitjacket that they're in because they haven't been able to develop their gifts, talents, and abilities. So, people, if you don't know what your gift, talent, or ability is, try something and find out. Try music. Try walking. Try studying something. There's so many online opportunities now you don't even have to enroll in a college in order to study the life of ants and how ants build an incredible community and, and everything so much online do something do something it is so much fun what was when you when you spent your time uh working with individuals that had addictions and different uh challenges you were implementing music. What was some of the strongest feedback and responses uh, that served you in return? Yeah, well, again, we had a music therapist. Um, I was doing the movement uh, therapy. Eurythmy mm. is, a, is, is a movement art. It's a bit like a Western form of Tai Chi. Um, okay. People watching this might know Tai Chi more than they know Eurythmy. Um, and then the Eurythmy therapy is a concentrated form of the movement so that you can affect uh, organs and concentration and uh, posture and just a whole bunch of stuff that are... Imagine you're breathing yeah. and... Yeah. So that, Fantastic. Uh, How... yes, our, our patients were, were suffering from that. But music was through, uh, you know, the whole... Uh, clinic. We had a special setup. We were actually subsidized by the European Union for a long time as a model uh, clinic in Europe. We didn't do the four to six weeks short term therapy like some famous uh, clinics. Um, we, it was, we were 10 to 12 uh, months because that's how long someone needs, really. Listen, with all due respect, four to six weeks, six weeks, get someone clean. Uh, get them feeling better about themselves, good food, good sleep for six weeks. They, they, they feel, you know, healthy again. Great. It's not difficult to do that in a certain situation with those surroundings. It's after eight to 10 weeks that the same problems start coming up on the inside that caused the person to get addicted in the first place. And that's when you can start doing the work with them. That's when you have to start going deep, yeah? So we had a community situation, a living situation for 10 to 12 months. And we said, listen, you're living here and people who live in the same village um, so have to do certain things together, not only clean and keep the place, place clean and, and eat and do that, but also look after their, their cultural life. That means we'll put on plays together, theater performances, singing in choir uh, together, uh, all those kind of uh, artistic things, yeah? as well as the, the, walk, uh, the work building. There was a farm uh, on, the, um, in the, uh, on the clinic grounds there. So there was a whole bunch of stuff going on. You just had to find out when someone arrived, what does this person need? At the beginning, we might put them on the farm, yeah? Um, but find out after five to six to seven weeks as we've got to know them better, that actually they should be in the kitchen of one of the houses cooking for people like lunch in the evening because that's where they could grow and, and use their talent yeah so in your in your years of of serving others in so many different facets how do you think the power of stories comes into play and how no. necessary are stories and experiences being shared Incredibly important, Kelly. Great question. Um, Why? Start off with the fairy tales because they're archetypal images. Yeah, mm -hmm. they go deep. They sit deep. Yeah, and there are certain things which you which you, you you hear as a fairy tale, 
Um, really good if you're a parent. Hey, parents out there, read Grimm's fairy tales to your children. Don't put it on a recording and you let them listen to it last thing at night. Your voice, reading them in the evening, they'll remember it the rest of their lives. Getting older, read the fairy tales yourself. Look at the images, Cinderella, yeah? Sleeping Beauty, yeah? Sleeping Beauty is actually one that we used a lot to talk about um, uh, addiction, yeah? Because there are three kinds of attacks on um, uh, sleeping, uh, on uh, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Three kinds of yes. attacks on Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. The Seven Dwarfs are the helpers, yeah? Snow White, she gets an attack from the evil stepmother. There are wonderful stepmothers the out there. Stepmother. This is just, you know, in the fairy tale, they have to take someone as a picture of the dark side of the evil aside an attack with the comb yeah so an attack on your thoughts was not fatal the helpers come along help get out the comb in other words say hey we can help you think things through properly you know you didn't quite think that through let's say i can think it through that's the helpers next attack the dress tied too tightly the dress the lungs the middle area where you've got your heart yeah so your feelings your feelings are hurt your feelings are wounded your helpers can help you work through that yeah uh, discuss your feelings, this and that, all the therapy stuff you can do. But the poisoned apple, when it starts to go into yeah. that unconscious sphere of the will, the digestion, where you use your limbs, where you use your willpower, an attack on your willpower, oh, that can't be helped from the outside. You have to want to do something yourself. So the helpers do the best thing that they can do. They put her in the glass coffin, put out in the world, so picture of substance abuse, they're in the world, but not fully in the world. They're in their own world, encased in the coffin and looking out at it, yeah? And then you get the two halves which have to, tonight, have to unite. The prince comes along, sees her, falls in love. It's your two halves of yourself joining, whether it's the, the, uh, 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 the frog that has to be kissed to reveal itself. Elliot, I was in junior high when I was introduced to Grimm's fairy tales because nice. I was in competitive speech and I did not, <laughs> I was, I said, what, what, <laughs> what is going on with these stories? They were amazing. And so then, of course I did the competition. I won, but congratulations. I, <laughs> thanks. But it was from that point that I really started uh, investigating his other fairy tales and looking at the, the reality of how these stories were put together and the meanings behind them. It's incredible. It is incredible. And look at the meanings which are there today. Isolation, 2020, lockdown, isolation, self-isolating, someone self-isolating. Look at all those stories. We just spoke about Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Look at Sleeping Beauty, locked away behind the vegetation, self-isolating. <laughs> Look at Rapunzel, locked away at the top of the tower. the tower. The imagery in so many of these fairy tales is there's someone locked away at the top of the tower. How do they get out? We don't even know who they are. What about the man in the iron mask? The man in the iron mask. Not only is he locked away, Kelly, but you, you don't see who he is. You don't know who he is. He is. And, and even if you saw him, you wouldn't know what's going on inside him because you can't see his face through the iron mask. You don't know what his feelings are. Now, here we get to something really important today. More and more studies show over the last 30 years that the younger generations, people under the age of 28, are having more and more difficulty reading emotions in the faces of the people they are communicating with or in front of them because they're so used, you got it, they're so used to two-dimensional and not used enough to three-dimensional, yeah? That's why it's so important. Elliot, we took that uh, to your point specifically. I really, Eric and I, and I had conversations with my parents, I thought, this is... <laughs> This is what I'm doing with my kids. So they're 17, 14, uh, 12 and 11 right now. We moved here four and a half years ago. So the five years we were in Denver prior to moving here, I started, I made up 
uh, electronic manners. And I'm not, <laughs> I'm not kidding. We had, we take the kids out. We would take them to really uh, nice, very, very nice restaurants and things. So they need to learn from when they were little. Um, they just know how to behave and act and things like this. But with the growing this all the time, Eric and I were uh, on a date and a family had come in and they had uh, three, well, high school, at least high school and above kids. All five individuals, uh, this is about eight years ago, uh, nine years ago, they were all on their individual devices. Not one of them spoke to each other, not one. And we, we, it was like, I, I, we just weren't, we weren't raised that way. We don't operate that way. And we were all like, even now, I mean, our kids are older and they love it now. If we go to a restaurant and there's kids menus, we get six of them with crayons and we race through the, the kids menus, but we would color with them and play with them. And it really hit stung. And we thought we have to do everything we can to figure out how to address this with our kids. And so a couple restaurants where we knew everyone really well, <laughs> we said we would let them bring their nooks, their reading things. And so they, it was, it really, it was electronic manners. My mom was like, oh my God, Kel. So when the server came to the table, one, they have to speak for themselves and order themselves, but it was that device needs to be turned off upside down at your seat. It is not on the table. We use eye contact and we talk and until everyone's orders are done, and they walk away, you can get them out. And so we would do it, and not all the time, just periodically, we're going to let you bring your electronics because we're going to work on till they could figure out, oh, there's another adult at the table. Oh, wait, mom and dad wanted to engage with you guys. So that means close it up, put it down where your hands aren't touching and you're not looking. This was serious. People well, thought we were crazy. Having, no, no, having turned off for the whole meal. I'll tell yeah. you another thing that gets people communicating with you each other. Uh, I've got five children and um, when they were still at home uh, we didn't have a dishwasher because if you've got five children then we can all help clear off the dishes after a meal. We can do the washing up and the drying together and here it comes. It's not only good for them to feel water and dry and, and have the feeling of putting things away but the conversations that you get into after about five or ten minutes of someone washing and drying They've got a completely different depth than other uh, themes that come up in conversation. Oh, and also, also, you have to tell your children, this is not a punishment that, you know, you're washing and drying the dishes. This is preparation for the next meal. This is not doing something after, but this is something you're doing before. Or do you want to eat your next meal from dirty plates with leftovers on? It? No. So this is in preparation. Uh, for something there's so many good things that you can get out of just yes. doing the dishes with your children yes really in, i don't know uh, this uh, for eric and i uh we're very engaged uh with we have a lot of fun i mean the six of us we've never lived by family and we genuinely i mean we love each other but we genuinely like each other and have fun together and enjoy each other's company but we make, we, Eric and I have made a point of doing that since the kids were little, because that's, that's what was important to us. But it's interesting. The stories, stories are a big, are a big deal. Sharing your story, Elliot. Uh, you spend, you've spent so much uh, time uh, gifting people your knowledge, your experience, uh, you are an author. Why for you is it important to have some of your experiences and some of what you want to share with others in an actual book in words for other people to read? Kelly, you never know who you're going to touch with your story. I think this book now, Landed for Success, um, is a great idea because there are going to be different chapters in there from a whole bunch of different mm -hmm. people. And just like um, that fantastic book, Chicken Soup for the Soul, you know, there's a whole bunch of stories in there. Or The Moth, those 50 stories in the book, The Moth. You know, some people get touched by something, some people get touched by another thing. 
And if I share my uh, story, if it just touches a couple of people out there, a couple of people out there, imagine, imagine how much you've helped. You never know when a single word or gesture or thought or book or chapter in a book can help someone move on or understand something or do something. And, you know, if we're all doing that, if we're all, if we were all looking out how we could help each other, other people, sometimes, every now and then, the world would be a much better place to live in. There's too many people running around thinking, oh, what advantage can I get out of this person or that person? How can I get more for myself? How can I can this and that and everything, yeah? I don't mind people doing that. If you temper it, if you balance it with, yeah. what am I going to do with it? What am I going to do with my success, my, my wealth, my position of power? Is it only going to be for me? Or is it only also going to be for other people? If it's for your own elevation, for your own satisfaction, yeah, for your own advantage, yeah, it'll boomerang back on you. You're not going to be a happy person, yeah. yeah. But if you set it in motion for other people to have some kind of advantage out of it, some kind of help out of it, it comes back to you a hundredfold, a thousandfold, yeah. Agreed. To, uh, as we wrap up here, uh, time is one of the most valuable things we have. And I do very, very much appreciate you. And I appreciate the time uh, that you uh, hopped on here with us. For individuals who are on the fence about sharing their story, uh, wondering if, you know, I don't know, everyone else has seems to have a better story. What would your uh, advice or food for thought be for them? I would say to you, dear people who are sitting on the fence as Kelly just described, um, do believe in yourself. Do have a little bit more self-esteem. Um, as I just said, your story might be important to someone. And you know how much you've been touched by hearing other people's stories or message. And it's not a question of having a message which is straight away obviously important to you. The level of importance is a subjective thing. What's important for one person is not important for another person. So you won't know until you do it, yeah? So do it, find out. It will already help you to put pen to paper and put down your story. You'll get a lot more clarity about your story if you write it. And once you've written it, sleep on it and look at it again the next day. When I was writing my first book, um, I made a discipline to work every day. My time was between uh, one o'clock and three o'clock in the afternoon, regardless of whether I was inspired or not. And even if I didn't have anything to write for a new chapter that day, I looked at what I'd written the day before. And there was always something to change and to improve and do something like that. Just do it, people, because by writing down your story, you'll find out about yourself, you'll understand more about life, and there'll be something inside you working out. You know, that's how I reacted at that time, and I learned something from it. So if it happened to me again, I might be able to react in a different way, or I would do exactly the same again, because I realized that I did the right thing at that time. And, you know, here on Earth, it's a school, isn't it? We're here in life to learn. And learning, it's like going through a passageway, going from one room to the next room to the next room. And you don't get out of the room that you're in, the room where you have something to learn, that special room, until you've learned it. And you can hear some people say, I don't understand. Same thing happens to me over and over again. I always make the same mistake and everything. Hello, it's because you're not learning the lesson in the life room that you're in at the moment. And you might think that you're moving on, but you're just going through a revolving door and back into the same room to learn the same life's lesson because life is telling you, ah, 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 no, no, you didn't learn. So we're going to put another problem in your way. We're going to put the same situation in your way over and over and over again until you learn from it. Once you've learned, great. Go through the door now. It's not a revolving one anymore. Go through the door into the next room and hello, it'll be nice. 
for a long time or for a short term, short term, but in that room, there's another lesson to learn. So when you go into a new room and a new uh, space in your life, welcome it because you're going to learn something, you're going to grow, you're going to develop. And that's what it's all about, growing and developing. I love it. I absolutely love it. Thank you. Mr. Elliot Hiller, to all of you, Untold Stories will be launching early 2021. And if you are inspired, which I'm sure you were uh, by Mr. Hiller here, uh, please stay tuned because this will not be the last you'll hear from him. We'll be coming back with more. And then you can look forward to how you can plug in and help us when it comes time for promoting and launching and be part of the excitement and ordering a copy of your book so that you'll be able to read his chapter yourself. And I really do suggest finding him on Facebook and connecting and following and plugging into what he's doing. He is an amazing gentleman, uh, very, very much. And I don't know, I could, I could probably sit and replay this like five times <laughs> easily. Elliot, always a pleasure spending time with you. Uh, all the best, Likewise. all the love, all the energy, all the, everything uh, to you across the many miles here. And uh, yes, happy, happy Friday. Any last words that you want to give to everybody as we exit? <laughs> uh, first of all, Kelly, thank you so much. This has been wonderful. Um, last word, I believed it then when I was young. I believe it more than ever today. Love and peace, everyone. Fantastic. Great day, everybody. <laughs>